Centuries of Oppression The Road to 1918 Chapter 5 The Industrial Revolution The Industrial Revolution of the late 18th and early 19th centuries has been credited with the most significant social change since the Neolithic. Rightly so, for it broke family-based industry which had been the norm hitherto both in town and country. As such, one can trace the beginnings of the estrangement of fathers from the family to this event. Prior to this, men's work, whether agricultural or in trade, had been centred around the family home. For the first time, men would be required to spend their whole working day away from home and family. The modern tendency is to criticise men for lack of flexibility. Working men, it is said, have had trouble coping with the disappearance of traditional working men's jobs. But by traditional is meant factory work, which, taking a rather longer historical time scale, is not traditional at all, but a recent innovation. And men had to adapt to this innovation from the earlier domestically based employments. In truth, it is inevitably men who bear the brunt of changes in working practices because it is men whose whole raison d'etre is resource provision via work. Whatever your ideological opinion may be as to any more desirable state of affairs, this is an historical fact. Women, in contrast, have always had an unchallengeable role in the domestic sphere, especially as regards children. By the Industrial Revolution, the population of England was several times larger than it had been, say, at the time of the Civil War. And the rise of factory-based industry drove the rise of the towns and cities, causing mass migration from the countryside. In the mid-18th century, barely a quarter of the adult population of Manchester, Glasgow, Bradford and Liverpool had been born there. Despite these mass migrations, the hunger of the giant mills for workers resulted in widespread child labour, slave labour in truth, often taking pauper children from the workhouses of London for the purpose. Feudal landowners had been replaced by mill owners, the main difference being that their wealth was not always hereditary. Conditions for factory workers were notoriously harsh. The working day would start at 5am and not end until 7pm at the earliest. Some reports of the treatment of ten-year-old apprentice boys, ex-workhouse, had them working as late as 9 or 10pm, having had just one lunch break in a 16-hour working day. Is the most significant feature of this time patriarchal oppression, do you think? Only if the patriarch in question was the mill owner, I suggest. It should be apparent from the preceding accounts that women and children had always, from feudal times onwards, contributed to the remunerated work, albeit subsidiary to men. This became even more the case under the factory system. Whilst the working unit was no longer the family, the earning unit was still for a man's wage alone would not be sufficient. As power looms took over in the cotton mills, it required no great strength nor any great trade skill to operate them. Consequently, it was women who were employed as power loom operators. Those whom they put out of work were the skilled hand loom weavers, men. As Harrison puts it, the plight of the weavers was a vivid illustration of how helpless a section of labouring men could be when caught between the relics of the domesticated system and the full force of competitive industrial capitalism. You might be tempted to translate that to the present day. How helpless a section of labouring men might be if caught between the relics of the industrial era and the post-industrial modern world. Presuming an obligation on men to be the principal provider, it is inevitable that men must be most vulnerable to change in working practices. The highest earners are necessarily most at risk 
from employers' economies. Increasing population, together with the decreasing proportion of the population involved in food production, could be supported only by greater agricultural efficiencies. This came in the form of enclosures of former common or wasteland for cultivation and consolidation of small holdings into better managed farms. Essentially this was capitalism of the countryside, rewarding the enterprising but leaving the less able or less lucky in pauperism. Both in the town and the country there was increasing pressure on poor relief, still funded locally by parish ratepayers. As the pips began to squeak, reform of the old 1601 poor law led to the building of the workhouses, places which were deliberately made grim as a deterrent. More of that later. Unsurprisingly, working conditions led to a sequence of protest movements in the early 19th century. Infamously, there was the Peterloo Massacre in Manchester, 1819. Some 60,000 men and women had gathered to hear a speech as the culmination of a reformist campaign. It was entirely peaceable, until the yeomanry's attempt to arrest the speaker led them to charge the crowd with sabres swinging. Over 400 people were injured and 11 killed. The Luddites, famous for their unprogressive attitude towards factory machinery, were in many cases actually protesting for better pay rather than to remove the machines. The machine smashing was simply their form of protest. Similarly, the demands of Captain Swing were mostly around pay and also threatened machine breaking and other violence. But the Swing riots began following some terrible treatment of those on poor relief, including the harnesses of men and women to carts and the discovery of harvest labourers starved to death in a ditch. Nearly 2,000 swing rioters were brought to trial in 1830-31. 252 were sentenced to death. 481 were deported to penal colonies in Australia. And 644 were imprisoned. They were overwhelmingly men. Many young married men whose execution or deportation left families destitute. This draconian treatment was meted out despite no one other than one rioter having been killed in the riots. I invite you to contemplate how apposite is the feminists' patriarchal oppression of women by men perspective of history when the dominant theme is actually male struggle against the true oppressors. And why is it that left-leaning people today no doubt weaned on the events described here, have become so keen to back feminist distortions and so confused about their own history. With the Industrial Revolution came the rise of the middle class or bourgeoisie. In gender politics this is crucial because it is in respect of women that class distinctions are most emphatic. Whilst the mill owner could hardly be compared with his workers, he was, at least, still involved in running his business. The hallmark of the middle class wife, on the other hand, was complete dissociation from the world of work and public affairs. At this point one might be tempted to refer to it as the male world of work, but of course it wasn't. The mills were full of women and women had, as we have seen, been closely involved in remunerated work all along. From the feudal system and domestically based trades through to the industrial era, women and children had worked alongside men. Sure, women's working years and hours were constrained by childbirth and childcare, and also limited to areas not requiring great physical strength. Nevertheless, in 1850 to 1900, 30% of the workforce were women, the largest number being in domestic service. The perception that men did paid work and women did not was never the correct story for the working class 
and the perception that men went to work, women stayed at home, was only the norm for middle-class women, the bourgeoisie. Whether women's historical involvement in the workplace was a great boon to them is another matter. It wasn't, of course. It was an economic necessity. The feminists insist that work is liberation because financial independence means, well, freedom from a nasty abusive man is the implication. But what nonsense this is when placed up against historical reality. Working class women could not have survived financially on their own at any time before the 20th century. Once children entered the picture, even most working class men could not earn enough to support a family until the 20th century. Even in the 1930s, the lot of unmarried men was worse than that of married men. Read The Road to Wigan Pier. The picture of life against which feminists rail had barely existed before the 1950s, and by then the working class was beginning to enjoy ever greater prosperity. <laughs>